Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this moment. We thank you because you love us so much. As we are going to study from your word, we ask you again, guide us and teach us, help us to understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're going to have your seats, friends. Our today's topic is $10,000 for offer for a missing Bible text. $10,000 offer for a missing Bible text. You see, Sir Wilson, he was called Winston Churchill, a former Prime Minister of England, he was said that most people sometime in their lives stamp across the truth. Most jump up, brush them all, themselves off, and hurry on about their businesses as if nothing had happened. In other words, most people when they discover the truth, they turn away from it. They don't want to follow it. They turn away from the truth. It was Jesus who said in John chapter 8 verse 32 that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But friends, remember, the truth can only make you free only if you follow it. If you don't follow it, it will not make you free. But now that brings us to the question, what is truth? What does the Bible call truth? What is Truth. You see, there are three biblical definitions of truth. You can mark them down in your notes. First of all, Jesus is truth. Jesus is the truth. And number two, Jesus is truth, number one. We, saw, we see that in John 14, verse number six. You can mark it down in John 14, verse number six. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if you follow Jesus, you are following what? You are following truth. Because Jesus is the truth. It doesn't matter what our friends, our family, our anyone say about us. If you are following Jesus, then you are following the truth. You can be sure because you are following the truth. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. Now, the second definition of truth in the Bible in, is God's word. The Bible is truth. You can mark down John 17, 17. The Bible says, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So God's word, the Bible, is the truth. So if you follow the Bible, you know and you are sure that you are following the truth. Because the word of God is the truth. It doesn't matter what tradition of men may say or what the creeds of many churches or may dictate. If you follow the Bible, then you know that you are following the truth. Because the Bible is the truth. So you can have an assurance that you are following the truth if you follow the Bible. The third definition of truth is God's law, the Ten Commandments. Mark down Psalms 119 verse 142. Psalms 119 verse 142. The Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 142, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So we know that God's law is also the truth. The Ten Commandments are truth. When you keep the Ten Commandments because you love the lawgiver, you can know that you are following the truth or you are obeying truth. So there you have the three Bible definitions of truth. 
Number one, we see Jesus is truth. In John 14, verse number 6, truth is the word of God in John 17, 17, and truth is the law of God. That is Psalms 119, verse 142. And Jesus says that the truth will do what? It will make you free if you follow it. Yesterday, we discovered the amazing Bible truth from God's word. That the seventh day of the week is Saturday, is the Sabbath, God's holy day. But some people say, when they discover this, they say, ah, they look around and they ask themselves, are we following the truth? They become confused. They look around the Christian world and they see that almost no one keeps Saturday as the Sabbath. And that leads them to wonder, whether Saturday is really the right day to keep calling. Some of you may be wondering about that. They be like, is it true? Now people often ask, could the whole world be wrong? Could all the world be wrong? How can we be sure that Saturday is the Sabbath day that God wants us to keep calling? Well, remember, there are three definitions of truth. If we can find the Sabbath in Jesus, if we can find it in the word of God, and if we can find it in the law, then we can be confident because those three things are truth. We can be confident that we are following the truth. So let's do that today. If we find the Sabbath in Jesus, we find the Sabbath in the word of God, the Bible, we find the Sabbath in the law, then we know that it's truth. Now let's start with Jesus. Jesus is truth in John chapter 14 verse 6. Can we find the Sabbath in Jesus? Did he keep the Sabbath holy? The answer is yes. Now let's review what we learned last night. In Luke chapter 4 verse number 16. And he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for three. So Luke says that it was Jesus' custom or his habit to observe the Sabbath. Jesus never was kept Sunday as a holy day in his life. It was his custom to keep the Sabbath. Jesus commanded his followers to keep the Sabbath even after the cross. You can mark down Matthew chapter 24 verse 20. He said, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Christ was looking 40 years into the future when Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Roman armies in AD 70. He instructed his followers to pray that their flight, their running away, should not be in the winter because it would be cold and not on the Sabbath because they would be in church at that time. So evidently Christ, Jesus, expected his followers to keep the Sabbath at least 40 years after his resurrection. Now, we saw yesterday that there is only one commandment that Jesus specifically or specially told his followers to keep after the cross, and that was the Sabbath. He wants us to keep all the commandments, but especially he emphasized the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. So we can find the Sabbath in Jesus. He kept it holy. He commanded his followers to keep it holy. Now let's move to our second definition of truth. Truth is the word of God or the Bible. Can we find the Sabbath in the Bible? Of course, friends, we find the Sabbath all through the Bible. Let's start from Genesis, for example. In Genesis chapter 2, verse number 1 up to 3, the Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So we find the Sabbath here in the beginning of the Bible. It had nothing to do with the Jews and nothing to do with Moses at that time. 
Rather, the seventh day Sabbath is God's monument, a memorial of creation to remind us that we did not come from monkeys, the way we are told. You can find the Sabbath in Genesis. You can find it in Exodus. You can find it in Leviticus. You can find it in Numbers and even in Deuteronomy. All the five books, the first books of Moses. Now let's go to the heart of the Bible, the book of Isaiah. As we continue our review, in Isaiah 58, verse number 13 and 14, if you are taking notes, you can mark down. The Bible says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holiday, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thy own ways, no do, finding thine own pleasure, no speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight in the Lord thy God. He says, you see, God is telling us here in Isaiah to stop trampling on his holy day, the Sabbath. He says, take your foot out of my Sabbath. God says, or in other words, he says, stop breaking the Sabbath. That's what God is saying. We also found out in the book of uh, Isaiah that we will keep the Sabbath even in heaven. You can mark down Isaiah 66 verse 22 and 23. The Bible says, For as the new heaven and the new earth which I will make shall remind before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remind. Says, And it shall come to pass that from one new, ma new moon to another, that's from one month to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship me before me, says the Lord. So in heaven and new earth, we shall gather together every Sabbath to keep to worship God. Somebody who asked about the new earth, is, he asked, she asked in the question, or he, that what, about, what is the new earth that we will have? We will have a better study about that. And all those who are watching online also, you can write questions in the comment section. We shall answer them with time. So in heaven and the new earth, we will gather together every Sabbath to worship God. We find the Sabbath all through the Old Testament. In fact, there are 84 verses in the Old Testament that speak on the Sabbath. What about the New Testament? Can you find the Sabbath in the New Testament? There are 57 verses in the New Testament specifically mentioning the Sabbath. He is an example of them in Acts chapter 1 verse 12, in Acts 13 verse 14, in Acts 13 verse 27, in Acts 13 verse 42, 44, in Acts 15 verse 21, in Acts 16 verse 13, and Acts 17 verse 2. And then Acts 18 verse 4. Christians kept the Sabbath all through the book of Acts. That is 57 mention of Sabbath only in the book of Acts. There are at least 141 verses in the Bible that specifically speak about the seventh day Sabbath. So we find the Sabbath in God's word, the Bible. From Genesis revelation we find the sabbath everywhere and john 17 17 says god's word is truth so the third definition of truth is the law of god the ten commandments psalms 119 verse 142 who wrote god's law friends it's god himself so we can find the sabbath in god's law of course, the fourth commandment, God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And amazing, the one commandment that God says, remember, is what the world has forgotten. The world has said we forget, including the Christian world. They have forgotten. Let's review what God said. In Exodus chapter 20, verse number 8 up to 11, God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy might servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. Why? 
For in six days, he is the reason again to keep the Sabbath. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. So this is not just a suggestion, friend. This is a commandment. God has commanded us to keep the Sabbath holy. Friends, we found the Sabbath in Jesus. He kept the Sabbath. And he commanded his followers to keep it holy. We found the Sabbath in God's word. 141 verses talking about the Sabbath. We found the Sabbath in the law written with the finger of God himself. So we can be confident and be sure that we know that when we choose to follow and obey God and keep the Sabbath, we are following the truth. Even if the whole world is keeping a different day. Now some people say, what difference does it take, does it make? What difference does it make if you, which day you keep holy? The important thing is that you love Jesus. But Jesus said in John 14 verse 15 that if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Question. How many ten commandments are in the ten commandments? How many are they? They are ten. They are ten. The Bible says in James chapter 2 verse number 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. You see, friends, the devil does not care which commandment you break as long as you break at least one, at least one of the ten. And jo John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 3, up to 4, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandment. And he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So the Bible says that, Anyone who claims to be a Christian but does not keep the Ten Commandments is a liar and does not have truth in them. Friends, could it be that many Christians are essentially worshipping God but in vain? They are doing lies. Jesus said in Matthew 15 verse number 8 that these people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. He says in verse 9, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus says that if you are keeping commandments of men instead of commandments of God, your worship, he doesn't calculate it. It just tends to zero. It is zero. All of your worship is in vain. Vain means it is useless to worship him. Now, this means that we can sing, we can pray, we can go to church every week and give big money to church and we still be lost because Jesus is not counting it. Jesus says, your worship, if Jesus says my worship is in vain, if I am not keeping the Ten Commandments, then I am doing nothing. And friends, this is very serious. It is very serious. It was the same way when Jesus was here on earth. The Jews professed to worship God, but they rejected Jesus. Back then, they were teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. You see, truth has never been popular, friends, in this world. And neither have the majority chosen to follow it. They have always followed the wrong thing. Majority follow the wrong thing. And that ought to be a warning for us. Living at the end time. Now, that brings us now to a couple of more important questions. The question is, has God changed his holiday? Or has God given a church authority to change his holiday? Let's begin with the first question. Has God changed his holiday? Anyway, has God changed? Mark down Malachi chapter 3 verse number 6. Malachi 3 verse number 6. The Bible says, God says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Does God change? No, he doesn't change. Here's another text that you can mark down in Psalms 89 verse 34. 
says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. So we have said, when God, when we have seen, when God commands, he will not alter it. He doesn't change. He doesn't change what he has commanded. And Paul says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 9, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 9 says, There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That is in NIV. The Sabbath command reminds. It reminds. And God did not change it. Jesus did not change it. None of the apostles changed it. Well, what about the church? Has God given authority to the church to change his holy day? Now let's see what the Bible says. Markdown in Isaiah 8 verse number 20. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it's because there is no light in them. If they, the preachers, if they, the churches, if they do not speak in harmony with this book, the Bible, then we know that there is no light in them. And now if there is no light in them, they have darkness. And who is the priest of darkness? Is the devil. So they are working for the devil. So we are to test every church and every preacher by the word of God. That's why I tell you, mark it down in your notes. Because you are going to look up it in your Bibles at home. You don't need to trust me. You will need to trust this. What is truth? Truth is Jesus. Truth is the word. And truth is the law. I'm not truth. You trust the Bible. You don't need to trust the preacher. You know many people, you go to church... And then the preacher preaches and you say, that guy knows the Bible. I trust him. Who told you? Go and look up in the Bible if it is true. Many people think that everybody is, is true. Don't need to trust me. Trust the Bible. Whatever I give you today or any other day, go and look up in your Bibles at home. Many people, they trust their pastors as if they are God. As the Bible says, truth is your pastor? No. No. I am not truth. No one is truth. But truth is Jesus. Truth is the Bible and truth is the law. So don't trust anyone. Trust, test everybody by the Bible. So God tells us that we are to test every church by the Bible. We are to test every church by the law. Because those things are truth. St. Peter himself said in Acts chapter 5 verse 29, he says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Who did St. Peter say we should obey? God or church men? Should we obey church men or God? God. We should obey God. And even St. Mary said in John chapter 2 verse 5, whatsoever he, that is Jesus, said unto you, do it. So St. Mary tells us, whatever Jesus says, do it. Now what does Jesus say that we should do? Jesus says in John 14, 15, that if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. So let's come back to our question. Has God changed his holiday? Or has God given the church authority to change his holiday? What's the answer, friends? What's the answer? The answer is no. It's no. The answer to both questions is no. So how then do people support the idea of keeping Sunday holy? Surely if God wants us to keep Sunday holy in honor of the resurrection of Jesus or any other reason, there ought to be some evidence. Somewhere, somewhere, maybe in the New Testament. Now tonight we are going to look at the missing text. A mixing text. Someone has posted several large billboards in American city offering $10,000 for a missing text, for a Bible text commanding us to keep Sunday as a holiday. Or a next telling us, or a text telling us that God changed his holiday from Saturday to Sunday. For several years, the billboards continued to advertise the offer. But no one ever came to get the money. Why? Because there is no Bible verse in God's word to support it. Let's verify ourselves tonight. By looking at every text, every verse, 
that mentions the first day of the week or Sunday. And we won't be here for a long time because there are only eight verses. We are going just to look at them. The first six texts, the first six texts all refer to the same Sunday as the Resurrection Sunday. Mark these down in your notes. In Matthew chapter 28, verse number 1. Then the second one is in Mark chapter 16, verse number 1 and 2. Then the next one is Mark 16, verse number 9. And the next is Luke chapter 24, verse number 1. And then John 20, verse 1. And the sixth one is John 20, verse number 19. All of these verses are referring Sunday as the day that, the first day of the week, as the day that Jesus rose from the dead. They say nothing about Sunday being a holiday, no any command that Jesus said that we should honor Sunday because of his resurrection. In fact, the first two texts state clearly that God's holy day, the seventh day, the Sabbath, had ended when the first day of the week had come. So one thing is obvious from these verses, from both Mark, John, and Mark and, uh, and Matthew, that Sunday is not the Sabbath. Now, they had, they, the day had passed when Jesus rose from the dead. The day that, 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 that is called Sabbath had passed when Jesus rose from the dead. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verse number 1 up to 4, And when the Sabbath was passed, that was Sunday, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had brought sweet spices, and that they might come and anoint him. So Mark tells us that it was the first day and the Sabbath was over. Meaning that the Sabbath was a day before the resurrection. It says, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, so the Sabbath had passed and it was the first day of the week. They came unto the sepulchre, that's the tomb, at the rising of the sun. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. Matthew says in Matthew 28, verse number 1, in the end of the Sabbath, it was the end of the Sabbath, it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, they are Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And Matthew 28, verse number 6, the angel tells them that he is not here, he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. So please notice that they hear the four Gospels. They say, if God wanted us to keep Sunday holy, friends, Mark did not know. Matthew did not know. John did not know. Luke did not know. They did not seem to know about it. Instead, we find the Gospels, which day that God, the day, the real day that God's, God's people kept holy was Saturday or the Sabbath. Matthew records Christ's command to keep Sabbath after even the cross. Mark tells us that the Sabbath was made for man. Luke shows us that Jesus himself kept the Sabbath. And Luke tells us that the Sabbath is between Friday and Sunday. And John records Christ's command, If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. So the gospel writers make it very clear which day is God's holy day. Now let's go now to the writings of Paul, where many people have troubles. <clears throat> we are going to start with 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 1 up to 2. Here is the text that some of the Christians have tried to use to support the idea of Sunday being the holy day. They say that Paul is telling the churches to take up a collection on Sunday in church. Now is that what Paul said? Now let's read the text for ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 16 verse number 1 and 2, the Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Notice this is a collection for the saints, not a collection of the saints. There is a difference between for and of. So this is a collection for the saints, not a collection of the saints. 
And at this time, there was famine in Jerusalem. You can read Mark down Acts chapter 11, verse 26 up to 30, and Romans chapter 15, verse 26. So Paul was writing to the churches in Asia Minor, requesting them that they should collect something for the famine-stricken saints in Jerusalem. Verse number 2, Paul says, Upon the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, let every one of you lay by him, where? In store. As God has prospered him, so that there be no gathering when I come. So first of all, does this text contain a command to keep Sunday as a holiday? Is this referring to a collection in a church on Sunday? Now, Paul says, lay by side in store. Not in church, but in store. That's the opposite of giving. That is storing. Put aside. This was to be done at home, not in church. So other translations of this verse make the fact very clear. Let each one of you put, put on one side and store up at home. That is according to NIV. NIV, that is way mouth. That is another translation. NIV says, save it up. And then, the New American Standard Bible says, put aside and save. So this was something that they did at home, not in church. Here, Paul is telling the Corinthians to do their accounting on Sunday. Because it's, a whole, it's not a holiday, it's a day of work. To set aside something that, so that they wouldn't have to do that when he came. So Paul is essentially telling the, these people to work on Sunday. In fact, did you know that Paul taught the church in Corinth to keep the Sabbath holy? Let's prove that from Acts chapter 18, verse number 1. The Bible says, after, three, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. We just read, we just read, from his first letter to the to the church that he established the church he established in Corinthian or in Corinth that is in first Corinthian now verse 4 in Acts chapter 18 verse 4 he says and he reasoned in the synagogue every sabbath so paul could go every sabbath at church and persuaded the jews and the gentiles so while paul was in the city of Corinth he held meetings there every Sabbath in the church around that time, teaching both the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Greeks. Now, how long did he continue teaching in the church of Corinth? Now, let's read Acts chapter 18, verse number 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, how many Sabbaths are in a year and six months? That would be 78 Sabbaths. 78 Sabbaths. For a year and a half, 78 Sabbaths. So Paul taught in Corinth and raised up a great Sabbath-keeping church. Now, he's writing his first letter to the church in Corinth. He knows they will read that letter on the Sabbath when they gather to worship on the Sabbath. For, because he has taught them for over half and a year. So the, he knew they will gather on the Sabbath and he tells them, before you forget tomorrow, put something aside for the people in Jerusalem. Prepare a gift for the people of Jerusalem. So Paul is telling them to work on Sunday. There is no evidence from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 that Sunday is holy. Now that leaves us with one final text in the New Testament. The eighth text. Mark down Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. This is another text that some people have tried to use to prove that Sunday is holy. Acts chapter 20 is the only record of a meeting that took place the first day of the week. And this turns out to be a night meeting. Let's begin from verse number 6. If you are taking notes, we will read Acts chapter number 20, verse number 6 up to 13. And we are beginning at verse number 6. Luke writing says, 
And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And came unto them to try us in five days. Where we abode seven days. Verse number seven. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, you see, some of you may be thinking, may be thinking, see, they were breaking bread. That proves that Sunday is holy. Does it? You see, friends, actually, the Bible tells us in Acts, 20, Acts 2 verse 46 that the disciples broke bread every day from house to house. So if breaking bread makes a day holy, then every day is holy. Now we can't conclude like that because God is specific in his dealing. And the Bible tells us that Paul preached until what time? Until midnight. How long? How is that long? He preached all the night long until midnight. He was a very long-winded preacher. I've never preached until midnight. Let's read on and we see what happened. Verse number 8. Acts 20 verse number 8. And there were men lies in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. Now this was a night meeting. They had to put lights on, lamps and candles. And many of them, they were men lies. And it says, verse 9, And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sank down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. No doubt, it was the hot summer evening, and they didn't have air conditioning back then. So this young man named Eutychus, he found some good air coming from outside and he sat on the window. And what happened? Because Paul was long preaching, the guy fell down and was picked out dead. Because he was, Paul was long preaching. And somewhere, after in the long preaching of Paul, Eutychus starting, started getting sleepy and dozing. Eventually he fell asleep. And because he was sitting on the window, he fell three stories, or three uh, stories up, down, and he was killed. So what happened, when, what happened when he fell asleep? He fell and he was dead. That is also can happen. Some, some, something bad can happen when somebody is preaching and you are dozing. Something bad can happen. So you don't fall asleep today. You never know what could happen. Well, just as uh, that if you fall asleep, you wouldn't be killed here. Because, because we don't have where you will fall. But you might start snoring and start making funny noises or something. You do something embarrassing. Now let's read verse number 10 now. The Bible says, And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourself. For his life is in him. So Paul, through the power of Christ, resurrected a witch cast. Now that's probably why this story was written in the Bible, in Acts chapter 20. Now let's read verse number 11 and, it tw and 12. When he, therefore, was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of the day, it says, so he departed, and they brought the young man alive, and were not a little comforted. How long did uh, Paul preach? All night long, until morning. <laughs> well, should we study until morning? <laughs> I'm not Paul. We will find out why in the moment, why he was preaching all night long. But notice, this was a night meeting. To understand this story, we need to ask the question. When does the day begin or a day end according to the Bible? You see, friends, biblically, the day begins in evening. In Genesis chapter 1, we find the day, we find each day 
started in evening and it ended in evening. He says, evening and morning was the first day. Evening, morning was the second day and so on and so on. So, in Bible, the day begins in the evening. Leviticus 23, verse 32. You can mark down. It says, from even to even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So the day begins in the evening. In the beginning of days, that's in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 3, it says, evening and morning was the first day. In Genesis chapter, th chapter 1, verse number 5, it says, evening and morning was the second day. Then in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 8, it says, evening and morning was the third day. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 13, it says, evening and morning was the third day, was the fourth day. 19, verse 19, evening and morning was the fourth day. And then 23, this fifth day and then 31 the fourth the, the sixtieth day so a day begins in the evening so evening is at the set of the sun you can mark down Deuteronomy 16 verse number 6 and then mark chapter 1 verse number 32 it tells us that evening is at the set of the sun so biblically each day begins at sunset so when the day goes down it's another day. For example, today, according to the world, today is which day? Today is Monday. But according to the Bible, because the sun has gone down, it is what? It's already Tuesday. We are already in Tuesday. So a day begins at evening. It's like this. From sunset to sunset, a day begins. The sunset to sunset. It doesn't work. Aha, it is from sunset, then another sunset to sunrise, and then sunset. So the day begins at sunset, it goes on sunrise, and then at sunset it ends. So that makes a whole day according to the Bible, sunset to sunset. So tomorrow evening it will be another day. We'll be entering another, another day. And today we are taught that the day begins at midnight. I don't know where it came from. So applying this principle of, uh, to Paul's meeting, applying it to Paul's meeting, let me illustrate with this video. We know that Paul was teaching on Saturday, on Saturdays from Saturday, that was the Sabbath, and he preached until midnight. So at sunset, Saturday sunset, Saturday at evening, it's already the first day of the week. So he preached from sunset, from sunset of Sabbath, I will do this. He preached from here until sunrise, until morning. And then the whole journey in the day, he was moving away. He was moving to his own things. So it is sunset to sunset. So applying it to this, this, this brother's meeting, it was in the evening. It was the first day. Aha, it has come. So it, he preached from Sabbath. That is from Sabbath evening. He preached from that evening until midnight and then in the morning on Sunday. He started his journey. So after preaching all night, he continues his, his, his journey after sunrise. That will be on Sunday now, the day of Sunday. So the whole night of Saturday is called Sunday according to the Bible. And then, then sunrise, we have a new day. That is Sunday. Then at Sunday evening, it was another day. You start another day. So friends, that's why some translations read this way. It says, on Saturday night, in our assembly for the breaking of bread. That is the new, Bible, new English Bible. See, sun, the sun had said it was already Sunday. Because in Bible time, or in Bible, according to the Bible, a day begins at sunset. Mark down again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, verse 5, verse 8, verse 9, verse 13, verse 19, verse 23, and verse 31. They say, morning, evening and morning was the first day. If you have not heard all of them, you can just, you, you will visit our online team and you mark them down. But you can go to Genesis chapter number 1 and then you will find them. Now, Therefore, we ha we, they were having the meeting 
in the evening of what we call Saturday, but yet it was the first day of the week. So, notice what the commentary says about this. It says, this is a Bible scholar, by the Bible scholar Hachio B. Hachet, they commented on the Bible, they, they states that the Jews recorded the day from evening to morning. And on that principle, the evening of the first day of the week would be our Saturday night. The apostle, that is Paul, held his last religious service on Saturday evening and consequently resumed his journey on Sunday morning. How long was that journey? Now that journey, we can read about it in Acts chapter 20 verse number 13. Now it says, and We went before to sheep and sailed unto Assos and intending to take in Paul for he had for for, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go foot, to go afoot, that is to go on foot. Now let's read it carefully. Luke said that with other they sailed from, from what? From Assos to, from Trios, that is here, to Assos. Now that would be from Assos to Trios. Look, you see, Luke and the company, they sailed, they used a, a, a maybe a canoe or something. And they moved from here. There was a, penus, a peninsula. They call it a peninsula. I don't know. But they were here. But they were supposed to use the canoe and then they come here. But for Paul, he wanted to use here by, by foot. He wanted to use there by foot. That's a drawing. So Paul, on the other hand, was planning to just use by foot by the next day. And now it was about 40 kilometers that Paul wanted to move by foot. And now, friends, if Sunday was a holiday, then Paul could not have walked for 40, 40 kilometers if it was a holy time. And you see, friends, in Bible time, it was too far to walk or to travel that long on a holiday. So just, that shows us, obviously, that Paul was not keeping Sunday as a holiday. Instead, we read from Acts 17, verse number 2, that it was his custom, it was his manner that to go to church on the seventh day, the Sabbath. But let's come back to the question. Why did Paul preach all night long? Now the answer is in verse 25. Acts chapter 20, verse 25. The Bible says, And now behold, I know that Ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So this was a farewell, a bye-bye meeting. It was a farewell meeting. So Paul knew that he would never see them again. He would never see them in this world. That's why he was preaching all night long on Saturday night. And then continued his journey on Sunday morning. So he knew he would never see them. So we don't find any evidence in Acts chapter 20 verse 7 that Sunday is holy. So friends, we have looked at every text in the New Testament that mentions the first day of the week. And not a single text instructs us to keep Sunday as a holy day. That's why no one has ever collected the $10,000. There is simply no text that proves that we should keep Sunday Holy. But you may be wondering, what about Colossians chapter 2 verse 16? Doesn't Colossians chapter 2 16 show that it doesn't matter whether or not we keep the Sabbath holy? So friends, this is probably the most misunderstood text in the New Testament. Let's read about it. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat and in drink or in respect of holy day, of a holy day of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are the shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Notice, this Sabbath is a shadow of things to come. Things to come. Let's read this text in context. Back in verse 14, which says, blotting out the hand writing of, that is, and writing. Remember, God's, God's law was written by what? By his finger. But these are handwriting of ordinances. 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So this is referring to Moses' law, the law that was against us. We studied that last night. Moses' law, we saw that, we learned that it was the law that was nailed on the cross. Now let's read the entire passage in context. That is Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 up to 16. The Bible says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Let no man therefore, because Moses' law was nailed to the cross, let no man therefore judge you in meat and in drink and in respect of the holiday of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are the shadows of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. So please notice that the Sabbath, this Sabbath is the shadow of things to come. Are we there, friends? It's a shadow of things to come. They pointed forward to the coming of Christ. The Jews had seven annual Sabbath. That's that they were required to observe besides the weekly Sabbath, which we call Saturday today. We, here we have a list of them. These Sabbaths fell on a date, like your birthday. One year, your birthday might be on Monday. The next year, it will be on Tuesday, like that, like that. So also them, they fell on different dates. So the Sabbath that Paul is referring to in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, they are the annual Sabbath, the Passover, the Pentecost are examples. The Pentecost and the Passover, they are the examples. These Sabbaths pointed forward to Jesus. They pointed forward to Jesus. Now the Sabbath days of Colossians 2 are a shadow of things to come. They are a shadow of things to come. What about the Sabbath of the weekly Sabbath? Is it a shadow of things to come or it should remind us of things past? It reminds us of what? Of creation. So it reminds us of the things of the past. God said, remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. So the weekly Sabbath is a memorial. It reminds us of creation. It doesn't point forward to something in the future. It points back to creation. But what about Sunday? The big question we are faced with tonight is this. Since Sunday keeping does not originate in the Bible, then where did it come from? Obviously not from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sunday was kept as a religious day a long time before even Christ's resurrection. When we study ancient history, we discover that nearly ancient civilization was shipped to the sun from Egypt to Europe, from Babylon to its succeeding empires. Sun worship was a center of their religions. In the book, The Worship of Nature, we read, The Worship of Nature, volume 1, page 529. We read this. The worship of, the, 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 in ancient Babylonia, the sun was worshipped from immemorial antiquity. What day do you think they worship the sun? On Sunday. The Sunday. That's why it is still called the Sunday. Sunday. In English, a day of the sun. Now, John, it is the Bible encyclopedia says, Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest, Sunday was the name given to the heathen, by the heathen, to the first day of the week. Because it was the day on which they worshipped the what? The sun. And what's even more amazing is that virtually every great Christian church admits that fact. They admit. Let me give you a few examples. First, the statement we are going to get from the great Catholic church. And one from the Protestant church. Here is what the Roman Catholic church says about the origin of Sunday keeping. It says the sun was the foremost. This is from the book, The Catholic World, page 809. 
These are on internet everywhere. It says the sun was the foremost god with hidden dome. Hence the church would seem to have said keep that pagan that old pagan Sunday. That is the pagan name that is Sunday, the day of the sun. It, that is Sunday, shall remain consecrated, sanctified, and thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to, Bal to Balda, the sun god, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. Now, let's look at a similar uh, statement from Protestants. So these guys are saying the pagan Sunday dedicated to who? To Balda, the sun god, became the Christian Sunday now dedicated to who? To Jesus. Let's ask the Protestant. Now this is a statement from uh, Dr. Edward Hiscos, or Edward T. Hiscos. He's the author of the Baptist, the original Baptist manual. He said, there was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day. But that Sabbath was not Sunday. Are we there, friends? That Sabbath was not Sunday. Of course, I quite well know that Sunday did not come, that's what he's saying, into use in early Christian history as a religious day, as we learn from the Christian fathers and other sources. But what a pity that it comes branded with the mark of paganism and christened with the name of the sun god, Sunday, and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. Here's a statement from a Catholic cardinal, James Gibbons. He said, you may read the Bible from Genesis, Revelation, and you will not find a single line, at least a verse, but a line authorizing the, sanct the sanctification of Sunday. He says, the scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. So this Catholic cardinal admits that Sunday keeping is not based on the Bible. We will not hear. Now, another statement from a Protestant, Pastor Mike Hayes, a pastor of one uh, 10,000 members church in the last Texas. It says, the reason we have church on Sunday is not because Sunday is the Sabbath. In fact, Sunday is not the Sabbath. Then he says, Saturday is and has always been the Sabbath day. There is no commandment, there is no commandment that changed the Sabbath to Sunday. This is a guy. He's, he wrote it in his book, When God is First, page 121. So we see that both honest Catholics and Protestants admit that Sunday keeping is not biblical. I had a student, I told him, go to your pastor, go to your priest, and ask him about Sunday. Do you know what they told him? You have started becoming mad. How could you question us? We know it is not there, so what? <laughs> I said, do you want to follow the Bible? And he, he, he chose to follow the Bible, and you too, you can choose. You better need to follow the Bible, not the people. This one was Pastor uh, Wilfred Lay. He's from Kenya. He was telling his congregation that Sunday is not here anyway in the Bible. And you know, friends, Satan has made it in the way that people, even they hear the truth from their pastors, the so-called pastors, but they continue blindly following. I don't know what you will do. So the real issue, friends, it's more than which day you keep holy. The issue is who will you obey? The commandments of God or the traditions of men? What did Peter say in Acts 5 verse 29? Then Peter said and the, and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. We obey the commandments of God rather than the commandments of men. What about you, friends? Whom will you obey? Ask yourself that question. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, do what? Do what? Keep my commandments. Friends, do you love Jesus enough to keep his commandments? That's why Joshua 
24:15 says choose for yourself this day whom you will serve but as for me and my house we will serve the lord how about it friends would you like to say with joshua as for me and my house we will serve and obey god would you like to say that that I want to obey God rather than men. Or you want to follow the traditions of men. The Bible is truth. Jesus is truth. The law is truth. Whom will you follow? Would you like to say like Joshua? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let me see those who want to serve the Lord. Say me, I will obey. Let me see your hands up. If you want to obey God. That's why I tell you friends. That there is hope for you. There is hope for you who obey God instead of man. There is hope for you following Jesus is the best plan. There is hope for you in the strength of God you can. So there is hope in Christ for you. And friends, I want to tell you there is hope for you. There is hope for you who choose to heed God's word. And there is hope for you by tradition multitudes have errored. There is hope for you the truth of God you now have heard. So there is hope in Christ for you. I will invite the chorister as we finish, we make a commitment with this song. It says, I will follow thee, my Savior. I will invite a chorister to come and lead us through this song as we end. Let's rise up and then we will sing. Those who know it, we can go along. There is Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this moment. We thank you because you have taught us truth today. We ask you, Lord, give us grace and the power and the strength to follow the truth we have learned today. Bless this, your people, and help them to follow what they have learned. And help us, O Lord, so that we on our heavenward way, we go smoothly with your grace. We obey you because that's the way to go. Bless this, your people, today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Tomorrow evening, the Bible's longest, most amazing prophecy. Don't miss tomorrow, friends. Good night. May God bless you.